ask about the 38 hurricane. Now the 38 hurricane, of course, we was in that building then, and the hurricane was during the day, and we had no warning. Nobody knew. They never uh, tracked hurricanes, and there was no warning whatsoever. Uh, it would be considered, and this was September, the last part of September of 1938, and uh, <coughs> they had well, always had storms, and they had various names. They called them line, line storm, line storms, uh, August gales, depending on who you talk to as to what they called them. But they never had a storm in my lifetime, of course, uh, equal to that 38, either before or since. We've had several hurricanes since that time, but uh, that was the bad one. What was it like? Well, uh, it started out in the morning, and uh, we had, at that time, we had two telephone trucks that uh, we stored overnight and took care of and furnished gas and oil and washed them and lubricated them did just about everything on them. And uh, so anyhow, this storm started out and then it uh, increased naturally in wind velocity and rain to the point where these two men that worked for the telephone company uh, came to the garage because they quit because it was raining so bad. Uh, working on the lines or whatever they might do. And there was only two telephone men in town at that time. And uh, anyhow, they brought the vehicles in and we put them inside of the garage. And uh, this storm kept getting worse and worse. And by the middle of the afternoon, things were flying around. And uh, we, we had no idea it was a hurricane. I don't know if we'd ever heard of a hurricane. <laughs> and there was a big front door there and and high and that door got to flopping back and forth and we thought that door was going to let go any minute now that was in the front yeah. on the street side this is the and golden eagle building golden eagle Ridley. building yeah and these telephone trucks both of them had uh, wooden extension ladders mm -hmm. on them so that they uh, reach the pole? Could, well, they went up the pole with hooks, as they called them in some cases, but these ladders had hooks on them, and if they had to splice a, a cable in between two poles, they'd put that up, and this hook would go over this cable that held it. A steel cable in those days held the electric light and all the rest of the wires. But anyhow, we had these two extension ladders. So we took one of these extension ladders, and put it up uh, on top of the door mm -hmm. and used the, one of those trucks uh, to keep the ladder from slipping on a concrete floor. In other words, we, we put the ladder on uh, the rear wheel of the truck, and put the brake on on the truck so it couldn't move, and uh, pulled that ladder up as tight as we could. And that kept the door from flopping wow. in and out like that. And then we began to realize that uh, we had a storm, yeah. and then we had in the back uh, that went into the shop, we had another door like that. The door in the front was like uh, bond doors, they used to call them, that opened up like this and then came back together. And as I say, when they were fast like that up in the top there, they got the flopping back and forth. But we saved those. They never did let go. And they would have if we hadn't put those ladders up there to brace them. But the one out in the back, that was on a, uh, it had rollers. And they would take and take a piece of flat uh, steel, maybe uh, oh, half inch, and fasten it to the building and then hang this door on it. And this door had rollers on it very much like a train being on a track. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would have a stop and you just take a hold of the door and slide it sideways and yeah. it would open by going down the length of the building. 
and that's the door that we had in the back. And there was nothing holding it on the bottom yeah. uh, except uh, when we left, and by that time you did hook the door when you left from the inside. But uh, unless the door was hooked, it would it could flop back and forth like that. If it, and it did. It did. <laughs> it did, yeah. Now, uh, by this time, this 1934 and 1938, Chick Phillips had come to work with us. And he had worked for Nat Smith prior to that. And Nat Smith went out of business and he went to work for Promised Land because he couldn't make a living without an agency to sell a car once in a while, which he didn't have. He did sell De Soto's at one time, but that was during the, the uh, bootlegging days. But the bootlegging was all over, of course, by uh, 1938, because that was done away with, I don't know, 34, somewhere along there. But anyhow, <coughs> uh, the first thing that we knew that uh, something serious might be happening, this door, uh, the wind blew this door off. Now, that, that door had to weigh several hundred pounds yeah. because it was made out of uh, like two by eights or two by tens and was probably at least nine, ten feet high and uh, probably twelve feet uh, wide. Mm -hmm. And that that door came off, the wind picked that door up and took it off of the, the, the rollers came off from that track like that was up on top and that's the only thing that held it and uh, it came up like that and that that door we stood right there and watched it and that door went just like a, a piece of paper yeah. in the in an ordinary breeze just floated yeah. and it came down in the backyard and Chick Phillips had a 1937 terraplane Hudson terraplane that he had bought and uh, it came down and laid on the trunk of that car <laughs> just as gentle as it could be. It just, uh, it never dented it. The really? only thing that it did, uh, some of the paint came off the door onto his car. His car was a brownish, <laughs> not brown, gray. <laughs> and this door had been painted with a brownish paint. <laughs> and he had this little spot there where the door came down and kind of would and that's the only time that door moved was then. It's so lucky they could have crushed that car if it landed on it. Mm -hmm. Never hurt the car. Now, uh, there was a driveway between the house that the lady owned the garage and the garage uh, that we used. And she used it also. It was wide enough for uh, two cars to meet and pass in there. And that was the driveway that went out in the back of her house also. But uh, on her side of the driveway, there was a maple tree there. And that is where uh, I used to, now, I used to wash cars. I did everything. Uh, you did anything that came along in those days. And I washed cars. And uh, I would take them out in the summertime and take them and put them under that maple tree so that uh, because uh, you got washed cars and shade I use that maple tree as a shade. Anyhow uh, the wind of course was from the northeast in the beginning and that was a good sized tree probably two feet through the uh, butt of it and that tree just came over and laid over like that and blew down and lay on the roof of that garage but it did not uproot because it was not long enough for the tree to come all the way down. You see, it was only maybe it 20 hung feet. Hung up on the building. Yeah, hung up on the building. Yeah. See, the tree was probably 40 feet high, yeah. and there was only 20 feet between where the tree was and the building, so it just came over and laid on a building like that. Yeah. Now, that tree lay there, and uh, as you know, a hurricane always turns around and blows the other way. Uh, so when the eye of the hurricane went by, then uh, there's no wind, uh, and that may last for half an hour or something like that. And then the wind came out northwest and blew uh, probably just as hard 
Oh, well, we had no way of knowing, actually, how wide it blew. But it blew. Uh, but it blew that tree up. Mm -hmm. Blew that tree off of the roof and stirred it up again. And that tree is still there. Right. I can show you that tree today. That tree is still there, but it's... Is it on the right side or the left side? It's on the right side of the driveway. As you're, you're looking at the building. As you're looking down the by the building, from a street. Looking down there on the, on the right. right hand side of the driveway maple tree. that goes there now is a maple tree. It's pretty well beat up. <laughs> it's got a lot of scars on it from over the years. Now, I, I'm talking what? Uh, 1938. 1938, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Long time this, ago. Is, this is 2000, so. <laughs> what else about the hurricane? Uh, yeah. What did you do uh, from there? All right, well, now. Over on, uh, now we had a big uh, plate glass window in the front uh, of what was the office. Now you see this, this uh, building, uh, well when you was out on the street and you looked at it, there was a doorway that you could drive cars and trucks through uh, from the street on the right hand side of the building. Uh, the other half of the building, there was a petition that went through there. The other half of the building was the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, the office was just in that building, and it was maybe uh, 16, 14 feet square or something like that. And uh, the rest of it was all shop and storage space. So <coughs> we stood, uh, when we see these trees going down and so forth, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something serious. We had never seen anything that bad before. And I remember we were standing in the office there. The damn door <laughs> flew off out in the back. And we wouldn't go stick out around there in case that door decided to come in the shop. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyhow, we were standing in the office looking through that window and over on the corner of Church Street and uh, uh, Gingerbread Lane, there was a older building over there that the village used to rent. And they stored stuff like in the old snow fence and to get it in out of the weather, that's all it mattered to. They never uh, had any vehicles there of any type. But uh, uh, as I say, primarily that snow fence in there. But I remember seeing that and all of a sudden the roof let go and it just just like a flag in the breeze that roof started to go like that and the first thing you know it took off and where it went I have no idea where it ever landed and there was trees coming down out in the, uh, all over the place look through that window and I don't know well nothing hit that uh, uh, plate glass window yeah, lucky. that we had and of course, that was on the south side and was protected somewhat by the rest of the building, you yeah. see. So this was in the afternoon? Yeah, this right. was in the afternoon. Well, by, uh, oh, now this was September, last part of September. By five, six o'clock, the storm was over. Mm -hmm. It was all over. And we went out, uh, well, as soon as it calmed down, we went out to look around and we couldn't believe what we saw. I mean, uh, there was roofs with this being, <laughs> some buildings had blown over. I'm talking about garages and set on posts and that. Uh, I mean, this would be people's own garage that they put their car in. Right. And, oh, it was a mess. The roads were full. How did you get home? I didn't. Mm -hmm. That night, uh, now, there's no telephone, there's no water. There is nothing. <laughs> Anyhow, now I had no idea what had happened down in the swamp. Uh, How did you blame? That was the lay lowest part of town. Right. Uh, we knew uh, that the water had come over the beach banks. Now, my wife and son was down there and I didn't know what happened to them. No way of getting there. I couldn't get there. So where did, where did you stay that I night? I stayed with Dan Tucker's oh. house. I slept in his house over, right over here on Sherwood. Sure. Mm -hmm. I stayed there all, every night. I didn't sleep for a long time. And no way to get word down to no the family. No way. No. Wow. 
couldn't get there. So they didn't know where you were. I didn't. They didn't know where I was. Yeah. I didn't know where they were. Yeah. And but I did know because somebody said that uh, uh, the ocean came into the pond. Yeah. And they were right in uh, the back part of Hook Pond, That's you know. Right. I bet you didn't sleep very well. No, that I didn't night. sleep very well that night. And anyhow, and and you can't believe, but you couldn't even walk. There were so many trees down; it was impossible to walk in through the trees to right get in anything. the village. Right in the village, there was 162 of those big elms yeah. came down from Newtown Lane to uh, Woods Lane, yeah. other end of Town Pond. All on Main Street. All on Main Street, right? And it it was just a, a solid mass. And you see, the leaves were still on the trees yeah. then, because this is the last part of September. Right. And it was just a solid mass. There was no way could you walk, almost impossible to walk anywhere, yeah. with so much debris down and so forth. So anyhow, of course, the next morning, I tried to get home and did get home. Uh -huh. Now, I managed to walk, and I got down to, uh, now, you see, the difference is by the time the storm was over, was getting dark and so forth, that's the reason I couldn't, it was just plain suicide for me to try to walk home after dark. Yeah. It, it was impossible. You couldn't do it. And I didn't do it. But the next day, I went down but and was able see. to uh, walk in and around and all of this debris that was down. And there was a lot of it out there. You can't believe how bad it was. But anyhow, it. Uh, uh, was nice, beautiful day, calm. Uh, you never know we had a storm. Yeah. The weather was <laughs> beautiful. All the air had got cleaned out and blown away. Whatever yeah. dirt and dust was in the air around here left. So how did you go from well, Sherrill Road? Well, I, I went from Sherrill Road, and I got over to Newtown Lane, mm -hmm. and the trees that was down on Newtown Lane lay pretty much lengthwise. Now the trees that was down on Main Street uh, lay crosswise. Sure. You see, they came down this way across the Main Street. Yeah. Now on Newtown Lane, because it's perpendicular. It, the, the, both of the winds ran lengthwise, yeah. there was trees down, but they'd be like down on the sidewalk. Yeah. So there was not the tangle of uh, limbs and everything on Newtown Lanes. There was on Main Street. Yeah. But... So where did you cross Main Street? Uh, I don't know. I went down David Lane. Yeah. But where I went across, where I got through Main Street, I, I really don't Can't know. Remember. But I went through the, climbing through the branches and so forth, I got across the street uh, to where I got to David's Lane and I went down David. Now David Lane was the same way. You see, the wind had blown lengthwise yeah. on Davis Lane. And there was, oh, I don't know how many trees, thousands of trees down in East Stanton Town. Yeah. Uh, no, East Stanton Town, South Ham Town, and oh, anyhow. Uh, I got down to the swamp, and there's a hydrant down there on the right hand side, and that hydrant is still there today. And you can go down there and look at that hydrant. And the Hugh Fowler. Right yeah, on the right hand side as you're going down. Hugh Fowler had a rowboat that had been in Hook Pond. Because mm -hmm. he had the rowboat in Hook Pond. He was sending Neil Potts in there. And, and uh, I guess, I don't know whether he had fikes in there or not, but I know there were fish in there. But anyhow, I don't know how that uh, rowboat got tied to that hydrant, but somebody. Uh, either rescued the boat <laughs> that was afloat and tied it there to keep it so it didn't go anywhere. I don't know, but there was this rowboat and it was floating. Mm -hmm. And I took and, and uh, took my uh, shoes and stuff off, and I was able to walk to that hydrant. But there was at least a foot of water around that hydrant wow. at that time. And anyhow, I untied, and the oars were still in the boat. Mm. So uh, I untied the boat, and I took that boat, and I rowed across 
the, the dream of Book Bomb. And I don't know, I can't remember whether the same guardrail is there today that was there then. But if it is, the water, when I went across the bridge there uh, at where the duck pond is, there was no guardrail. Yeah. In other yeah, words, that so. was underwater. Yeah. And as I say, I don't know, it may have been replaced in that time, because this is a long time ago. Yeah. Now, did you row down to I, I rowed down, you? and I got, uh, if you go down there and look today, Dr. Terry's would be, if you go down David Lane, Dr. Terry's would be the first house you come to after you go by the ducks, uh, on the left-hand side of the road, right. and it faced uh, each lane. And that was built up higher. And it, that one had a cellar. But apparently when they built that, they built the cellar and then came in and filled in with dirt around the cellar. Mm -hmm. That made a high, much higher yard, you yeah. see. And uh, that was not underwater. So I believe I went, I know I went as far as I could mm -hmm. with the rowboat. And that was probably to his yard, Dr. Terry's yard. And then I could get out of the boat and walk across his yard and uh, got over to where our place was. Now, Florence's mother and father's place was higher also because he had filled in a lot there before he built the house. Mm -hmm. You see, so uh, the house was up and the house was on posts. And it was, uh, oh, probably two feet or more. Uh, the floors was maybe, uh, <laughs> well, two feet higher than ours. Right. Although ours had two steps to get into our house out in the back. Yeah. So ours was off the, off the uh, ground right. quite high. And anyhow, I went across that Curry's lot, went in the back, and I, it was a mess. Uh, all of the mud of Hook Pond, <laughs> seam saw, was in our backyard. Mm -hmm. It, uh, accumulation of years and years of mud in Hook Pond, and when that ocean came over the beach banks like that and went down into Hook Pond, uh, it just picked all that mud up and so forth, and that came with all the water, and we had, uh, oh, it was almost up to your knees. Mm -hmm. uh, no, after the water had settled away, and nothing but mud out in the back, you couldn't lay in it. We had dead fish right out in our uh, backyard. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, now I did not know, of course, what happened to anybody down there. I didn't know whether even know whether the house was standing, but and then of course Florence told me what she did. Uh, when uh, it looked as though well to go back a little bit further, of course nineteen thirty nine son and uh, Florence's younger brothers was all in school and when it got bad uh, Lawrence's father, if he was working that day, he had come home mm -hmm. anyhow, due to the uh, bad rain. He yeah. uh, had quit work and had come home, and things began to fly around. And he said, well, I'd better go pick the kids up, which he did, took his car. And there was only one school, which is uh, middle school today on Newtown Lane. And he went up and picked up the three boys, Mel and Don, and the son, uh, Cutter, as they called him, we have called him son, and brought him home. And they just got home in time before all the trees, if he'd been uh, just a, a short time longer, he never would got home with a car. But he did get home with a car because that was before the storm got so bad. Yeah. He's so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just think of coming down uh, uh, Hunting Lane, which is the way he came, and if those trees had been blowing over, yeah. they could got killed. No yeah. trouble at all. I crushed that car like nothing. It was just a Ford station wagon, you know. With three of the kids in the car. And uh, three kids in the car. Everybody around here was so lucky that there wasn't more yeah. 
loss of life than there was. There was quite a considerable loss of life, but uh, a lot more people could have got killed. But anyhow, uh, now Dr. Terry had a rowboat that they only used occasionally, and they used to bring that home because they'd put it on a trailer and bring it home, but he had it uh, and would go down to Thermal Harbor with it. So he had this robo in the backyard, and when the water came in, uh, Lawrence's father uh, loaded the three kids, and Dr. Terry also helped, and floated the rowboat from out where our place was out in the back, which is 30 feet behind the main house out towards the swamp. <coughs> over to Dr. Terry's. Mm -hmm. So they went over to Dr. Terry's and stayed. I see. And Graham, in the meantime, <clears throat> she's out in our place because her father and Dr. Terry's didn't care of the kids. She, by this time, the water had broke over and was coming uh, from the ocean, mm -hmm. coming into uh, Hook Pond. They knew they had to get to higher had to, ground. Had to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Well, Graham, of course, Florence, uh, was trying to save what she could, and she took, uh, she just uh, uh, done the laundry, <laughs> and she threw that up on the bed, <laughs> uh, which she had brought in because it was blowing so hard in the, during the day, and it was still wet, but she brought it in in a clothes basket, so uh, when this water become in the yard, she put that up on the bed, and other things that she could reach, she threw up on the bed. Now, as I say, our place was up uh, two steps to get to the floor, and uh, water came in so that, now we had two exits. Uh, there was one that was there originally in the first uh, square room that uh, Florence's father had built. And that had a concrete step, soup or whatever you want to call it, and two concrete steps to go down to get down to the ground level. Uh, he later on built uh, that what was our third room out of one of the car garages. And uh, that had uh, just wooden steps, but it did have a door that went into the garage also. So there was two doors to get out of our place, and that's the one Graham came out of, was out of the one and went into the garage. Now, the garage was just a shed. Uh, it was new construction. It was all new stuff when he built it. But uh, he built a three-car garage, and he uh, had this room that was, uh, uh, well, 18 feet square, roughly, and a shop on the end of it. So it was all under one roof, but there was no doors on the garage, but there was two windows in it. Now, when Florence stepped out of our place and into the garage, the garage, uh, the windows was up maybe, oh, they, they were quite high, and maybe the bottom of the windows were shoulder high. Mm -hmm. They were big windows like these, but they were up higher than normal. And uh, of course, the uh, windows were gone, it blew, blew those out. But all of this uh, garage start became a place for this water to build up. Uh -huh. Now you see, when she stepped out and went down two steps, water was right up under her arms. Mm, wow. And uh, she waited from there, and she went over to Dark Terrace. Yeah. Now, Florence's mother was not here. She was visiting her sister up in uh, Setauket. Mm -hmm. And they heard of the storm, but they had no idea what happened here. Yeah. All of the hurricane was on the east end of Long Island. Uh, halfway up the island, they just had an ordinary windstorm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and uh, no trees came down or anything like that. Yeah. <coughs> but. I didn't realize that Graham King was out of town oh, yeah. at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She never got home for a whole week at least. Yeah.
No telephone. She didn't know what had happened. Yeah. And there's no tell all the telephone. You can imagine a big trees coming down. Everything came down with them. No telephones, no electric light, nothing. Were you able to get word to her up in Setauket? I so don't know. know. I, I really don't know. Yeah. You're so busy with other things, probably. Yeah. Now, uh, the next day, the day that I went home, I stayed home and did what I could. Now, we had mud. Uh, well, I, I had, you had to have boots on to walk around the yard. Mm -hmm. And the mud, uh, before it, the water was gone, of course. But <clears throat> the next day, the water gradually seeped away and disappeared. But the mud and everything was still there. And, and that was up nearly to your knees. And it was just like walking around in chocolate pudding. Yeah. Uh, Except not that pleasant. <laughs> not that pleasant. And there was fish. There was everything. And stink. Oh, old rotten leaves that had been in Hook Pond for years. And, you know, you know, an old dirty mud smell like that. And yeah. that was dirty out there. Yeah. Now, uh, everything was wet through. Uh, nowhere to lay anything down. Yeah. Out in the yard. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, that same table, it's downstairs there now, that, uh, I guess it's an oak table, that's the one that my mother gave us when we was married, because she, I remember she had it when I was a kid, from the time I can remember they had it. And we used it uh, for, uh, y your dad uh, used to do his homework on it, yeah. and we had uh, just bought a new uh, silver tone radio from Montgomery Ward, uh, and they weren't cheap in those days. This was uh, a, it wasn't a, a console as they called them. This was uh, well portable. They called them portable because you picked yeah. up and carried it around. But it was a good sized radio, and uh, we paid I don't know probably sixty dollars for it, and it sat on this uh, table. And we <laughs> were so happy. The table never upset. <laughs> oh, you didn't lose your radio. You didn't lose the radio. <laughs> and that was one of our most priceless possessions. Uh -huh. Because you know, we'd been married, we married in 1930. Now this is 38, and this radio is new. That's the first new radio we bought. We had a Philco, one of those that come up like that yeah. thing, that somebody gave us. I, I don't know where that came from. A member of the family probably bought a new radio, and I'm talking about maybe Graham's family wants to talk. It may have, but somebody gave us this radio. We did have that, but uh, it was a squawk box. It's, the speaker was wasn't the best. No. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I spent all day there, of course, trying to get rid of the mud. We finally uh, drilled holes in the floor hmm. and took a hose and washed everything in our place. Now, the water got up, uh, you see, Clarence's mother and father's house was up on posts. It was higher because he filled the land in before he built it and was out next to the road, of course. And uh, it just came up to the floor at that house. But that house was, uh, the, the land, <laughs> uh, where it was setting was uh, much higher than ours, you see, because it was, let's see, he had, a, he had a concrete stoop out in the back, and there's four steps that went up to that. So that house was quite a long ways off the ground, you see. And although we got a lot of water all the way under it, it didn't come up high enough. I don't think it ever came under the doors. I don't think it ever got inside. But anyhow, we had it, and uh, it was up uh, on our floors. It was mm, three feet up on a wall like that. And the day we left down there, 19 years later, well, we were there 19 years. You could still see that watermark there. And we painted it two or three times. But, uh, uh, that had soaked up a lot of mud. <laughs> 
And as I say, now, uh, it was probably five or six days before we got electricity. It was, oh, I don't know, two weeks, maybe before we got water. Now we had town water, mm -hmm. just like we have here. But the main saw came up when there was big, old, uh, big trees on uh, Main Street that had been there for 150, 200 years. There were great big uh, elm trees that was there. When they uh, came up and the roots and so forth, up comes all the mains. Yeah. I mean, all oh, there was water mains were broke every couple of hundred feet. Yeah. Everywhere you went, mm -hmm. if there's a water main there and a tree came down, it would bust the water main. Yeah. And now the light uh, was all underground, as you know. Same thing happened. All, all the wires, light wires and everything got busted because the, they were all underground in the village. Hmm. And it uh, took a long time for them to get, and they didn't have the help. I mean, uh, there was two men here who worked for the light, light company, Willard Bell and George Miller, hmm. and they was it. I mean, that. Uh, so you you can imagine the them all, all over East Hampton Town trying to repair these wires, and, and, and in some places, uh, like, <laughs> it was months yeah. before they got uh, electricity back mm -hmm. uh, that was up in, uh, on poles, like there are out here. The trees came down, the wires came down, the poles came down. Everything came down, had to clear out all the wood and so forth and put up new poles and took a long time and there was a few people that was working for, for the water company and, and the telephone company and light company. Okay. Well, as I say, we had two, two light, uh, telephone trucks. That's all it was in this area, two men. So it was a struggle now uh, after, well, I should say, uh, of course, there was no such thing as going out and hiring people. The village of a town, they didn't go out and hire anybody. Uh, if you was on Main Street, had a business on Main Street, lived on Main Street as an example, you, you just took your axe and you went out there and cut a hole through these trees because uh, uh, everybody did it. It's the only way you could. The whole town turned out and worked on that stuff. Everybody in town that had anything and was able to. Now you got to remember there are no chainsaws in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, there was hand saws. Got one downstairs, but they were bigger than that as long as I had two men. And uh, they would use those uh, chainsaws, and, I mean those uh, big heavy saws and pull them back and forth like that to cut off these big limbs. Uh, the first night that uh, they got a hole through uh, the village from Newtown Lane to Woods Lane. A hole through the trees. A hole through the trees mm -hmm. in the village, yeah. Enough to drive a car through. Uh, Jack Mahoney, which was a village cop uh, and one of the older ones. and, and we knew everybody in those days, of course, naturally. Uh, knew all the police force and everybody. And I had, at that time, Don had just gone to service, uh, and he had left a Model T Ford of his for me to sell. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't sold it, and I was using that to go back and forth to work. And now, uh, I got down street uh, with this car, uh, this particular night, and this may have been, I, I don't know, I, w I was trying to take this car home, I guess. I, I, I can't recall. So many things happened at yeah. that time. But uh, anyhow, uh, I remember Jack Mahoney uh, came over to me in the car and he said, uh, Let's ride up Main Street and see how far we can get. Now, as an example, Main Street itself in a business district had been cleared away to the point where you could drive a car through there. But he wanted to know, uh, in case of a fire or something like that, whether the fire trucks could get up the south end of town, how far the fire truck could go. 
<laughs> wouldn't much use to go and have the water in hell, but, <laughs> but that's what we <laughs> You can't think about it, no means, <laughs> no hydrants, what you said in the flat truck. <laughs> well, that's funny, I just have to think of that. <laughs> but anyhow, he and I would dance, Brother Dance, <laughs> uh, Mudley Ford, we rode up there and we could only get up as far as the flagpole. It was still, uh, the road was blocked from there probably to the beach, I don't know, and, uh, but this was maybe, uh, and what was after dark, I remember, and, uh, it must have been weird driving oh, through a tunnel uh, with You can't, and, uh, just like a jungle, you know, it, they, they just cut away, cut a hole in these yeah. limbs and trees, um, uh, just like a tunnel. Yeah. And as I said, leaves were still on the trees, you know, and, and boy, that was a mess. So, anyhow, I don't know how long it was. It was uh, when we got uh, to the point where I could drive down springs. Uh, I took all the uh, jugs and pails and anything that would hold water. I went down springs because my mother had a hand pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would go down there, and that's where we got our water, drinking water and uh, uh, cooking and so forth. So the water was available. No other water, no town water. He turned the faucet out, but no, <laughs> no main hook to it, and the water didn't come very good. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what about the damage down in springs? Well, that was the same way, but the trees weren't this big. Yeah. You see. The, the problem with East Ham right here in the village, those trees were so big. Yeah. Uh, there were two or three of those trees left there today, and you look at those big elm Dumps. trees, American mm -hmm. elm, and I'll tell you, they, they were big then. Yeah. But the ones that are left today, uh, ones that uh, just, uh, they didn't go all the way over, they yeah. fell on a house or something like that. They were able to put and them back And they, they brought them pulled him back again. Roy Craner up there mm -hmm. was doing tree work and, and uh, he pulled a, butt, a lot of them back up and stood them up and uh, healed them up by putting guy wires on them and so forth. And there's still two or three trees on Main Street yeah. that was there during the hurricane and they are big. Uh, but before that hurricane in the summertime, the leaves of the trees came right across and there was a canopy. You couldn't even see the sun uh, when the leaves was out. It, it, oh, it, was, it was beautiful, <laughs> and uh, it was hot, sickening boy. Uh, somebody said there was 162 trees that went down from uh, Newtown Lane up to Woods Lane, and I, I guess they were right because there was a bunch of them. And uh, now, I never went down Northwest mm -hmm. Woods after that. But they said uh, down in Northwest, you go down there and the trees, oak trees and that was down there, were laid down just like uh, if it was a corn field and the, mm. and the corn blew down. Yeah. Those trees blew down, all headed in the same direction. They blew uh, richly from the northeast wind, blew them down and they just lay on each other. Yeah. And, and Montauk, uh, was an island for I don't know how long. You see, you didn't find out. We had more to <laughs> more to do right home. Yeah. You, ne you never went twice again. <laughs> yeah. But I do know that uh, for a week or more, you couldn't drive across the uh, Nappy Beach because mm -hmm. the ocean went through. The it? ocean went through, yeah. and if it had not been for the embankment of the railroad, mm -hmm. uh, I think we'd had another opening into uh, Nampig Harbor wow. because that's where it went through. The, they broke through the dunes, went into Nampig Harbor, and there was water flying back. The tide was rising and falling right across the road. <laughs> and, uh, but, now, here again, I don't know uh, just how, <coughs> how they stopped it. But probably, and I'm just guessing, I, I think somebody must have gone there perhaps with uh, shovels 
and took the embankment uh, where the railroad was and used that, which was up higher, and filled up this uh, waterway that was running back and forth. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, there was so much we never knew. And there's no way of finding out. Uh, the only person that was right there was the one that knew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, uh, well, I don't remember what his name was, but young Scribner. Mm -hmm. uh, Scribner's jewelry store was in the uh, theater building. Mm -hmm. And they had a son, and I don't know what his name was. And, but I knew he was young Scribner, that's all I know. He was. Uh, 20, well, 10, 12 years younger than I was, and uh, he had a boat down at Montauk. He was a fisherman and had a boat down at Montauk, which is uh, now down where, the, like at the railroad station, that mm -hmm. part of the, of the uh, bay. And uh, when the storm began to get bad, the boat was anchored out there, and he took a rowboat and was going out to salvage his boat. And uh, somebody saw him uh, get aboard of his boat. And then the boat either broke the anchor line or pulled the anchor to the point where it didn't hold. Anyhow, the boat disappeared and never saw him again. Really? He got drowned, of course. Wow. Uh, there was three men from Springs uh, one, two, three, uh, what was it, four of them over there? I guess it was three. Anyhow, it was Vivian Smith, uh, uh, Herb Fields, and Gilbert Edwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only three. Now, uh, uh, see, who owned the boat? I guess. Fields, I guess, owned the boat. Anyhow, this was a small beam trawler, and uh, they had been fishing uh, around Gardner's Island, somewhere over there, when the storm began to get bad. And they started home, may have been headed for Bonnet Creek, or they may have been trying to get into Thrumal Harbor, but anyhow, they never made it. They disappeared, and never, there were three of them. Now, uh, uh, there was four of them. Who was the other one? Because I went to school with Gilbert Edwards, and he had a sister that was Abby Edwards. And they both lived over the Franklin Farm. That's over by where the uh, girl, uh, the girl scout, uh, Blue Bay. Oh, Blue Bay Harbor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was their property. Franklin Farm, and the house was moved from there, and that's down Fanigo now. A mm. uh, big two-story, big, I say, two-story house, old farmhouse, and that was moved from over there when the Blue Bay people bought it. Mm. But anyhow, uh, now, she, Abby Edwards, was married to Herb Fields. Uh, Gilbert Edwards was her brother. Oh, Sam Edwards was the one that owned the boat. Mm -hmm. He was one of her older brothers. And then Vivian Smith was no relation to him. He was just uh, working for him. And those are the four that got drowned. Mm -hmm. Now, she lost two brothers and her husband all in the same storm. Wow. And uh, They went out on the beam trawler in the storm? They were out in Gardner's Bay and never made it. Oh, they didn't get back in time. And they couldn't get in, didn't, didn't get in any. Way. Yeah. You know, the boat capsized, and I don't think they ever found the boat or yeah. anything. Uh, there was uh, now Edwards Brothers, which uh, had a uh, place down at Promised Land right alongside of Smith Meal. It was right the other side of Smith Meal, which was the uh, fish factory. Right. And there was uh, Several of those brothers, Doc Edwards was one brother, uh, uh, E.J. Edwards, uh, which owned the Star, was another brother, and then there was, uh, uh, well, I know too, Sam Edwards and Bert Edwards were brothers, and they were the ones that were fishing. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they had three 110-foot, uh, oh, they had bought them from the government. They were wooden boats. Uh, they had, I think they call them sub-chasers. Mm. But anyhow, uh, they were 110-foot beam trawlers. Magdalene was one, I can't remember the name of the other two, because the Magdalene uh, was still a bit, uh, around when I was in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. The other two, they never salvaged. But uh, anyhow, uh, two of them broke loose from down Promised Land. Now, this is in a, uh, a area that is... Sheltered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is all bulkheaded right. around it, and these boats are now tied up. Mm -hmm. And the lines and everything, see the water came up so high, uh, the boat was floated and broke the lines. Yeah. When the lines broke, the boat took off and that went for the window. One of them ended up in Connecticut, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, a half a mile or something from water. When the water disappeared, like in Long Island Sound, this boat was a half a mile up in the fields yeah. somewhere, one of them. I never did salvage that one. I don't remember, I can't remember, but there were three of them. And uh, they were run, uh, Captain Sam, which was the older brother, and Captain Burke was another brother along with the Doc Edwards' uh, generation. And then there was another one, Herb Edwards, which was Captain Burke's son. And, and he was on this one that uh, it went over uh, like at, uh, well, we'll say New Haven. Uh, there was a, a breakwater out there that was 20 feet high or something like that. This boat floated right over that breakwater and kept right on going inland until it <laughs> ran out of water. <laughs> oh, if we ever get another one of those, it will clean out everything. Uh, Bluff Road is the beach bank. Right. Everything from Bluff Road to Namagansett, uh, down across the Napig Beach, and all down through there, everything down there will end up over in Connecticut somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen the water up there. The loss of life around here, if we get a hurricane in uh, well, even any time now, but I mean, if we was to get one in the summer season, like August or September or something like that, it, there would have to be thousands of people that would get drowned. Uh, we know how bad it is now to get to, uh, well, from here to Southampton with the traffic. Just imagine if everybody was out here, got out on the road and tried to get off of Long Island, Never would get out on the highway yeah. if he was on a side road. So yeah. now, did you lose things back in '38? The stuff you had to get rid of after the storm? Not really. We never had anything <laughs> to lose, yeah. really. Now, you didn't know like your mattresses and stuff. No, like that. we were we were lucky. Uh, the water came up, and uh, now those old barrels that we had downstairs, mm -hmm. we had those. We brought those up here with us. That's where they came from. We had those. Somebody gave them to us. <laughs> and uh, it came up, uh, so it was just on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Never got into the drawer. Mm -hmm. But you look at it, and you could see the water mark about that much from coming up to go into the bottom drawer. And the bed was the same way. Mm -hmm. It never, never, due to the fact that we was two or three steps up off of the the ground, yeah. you see, <laughs> and uh, oh, it, it was a long time, and that mud finally dried up and got to be dust, mm -hmm. and every time, if the wind blew it all, that uh, dirty, stinking dust got over everything, oh. I mean, uh, you, and you still, you couldn't, uh, lay anything outdoors or anything. Months afterwards, yeah. it, it, it would seem like it was forever mm. disappearing before the grass came back and grew up through it. And, and, and the, the work that was around, I mean, it was 
months before they ever, the trees that they did salvage would, would be months maybe before they could uh, pull them up yeah. and so forth. And were there businesses on Main Street that were lost at that time or did people, everybody recover? Or? They were very fortunate. I don't remember outside of uh, plate glass windows being broken, roofs uh, would be broken through where a tree would come down and a limb uh, would go through the roof and break a hole in it and so forth. But none of the min, uh, business on Main Street ever uh, went out of business. Mm. It was it was a miracle that uh, there was not more damage than there was with those trees. But you see, it rained. Oh, it rained hard for hours before the wind really got strong. Mm -hmm. And that saturated the ground. And the trees did not break off. They came up and pulled the roots up. The stump and everything came up and just gradually went over like that and lay down against the building where they hit the building. The very, but of course the hurricane, uh, the wind and rain, right across every one of those